Welcome to the last session of day five of Streaming Media East Connect. I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen, editor and VP of Streaming Media. This is our fourth and biggest Streaming Media Connect virtual conference. It won't be our last. We've got another one coming up in August, but we are also beginning our planning stages for Streaming Media West in person in Huntington Beach in November. Steve Nathans Kelly will post a link or just did posted the link in the chat to all the information we have about Streaming Media West. If you're interested in speaking, the call for speakers is open. If you're interested in sponsoring, all the sponsorship information is there as well. And we hope to have a program up on that website by the end of June. As always, this and every Streaming Media Connect session is going to be available on our YouTube channel within 24 hours or so of live broadcast. Steve's also probably going to post a link to that channel in the chat. Uh, you can also find it by going to streamingmedia.com and clicking on the cleverly labeled video tab and pulling down to conference videos and finding all of our conference videos there. A couple of housekeeping notes. The chat will be open, but we do ask that you put any questions for our panel in the Q&A tab and Jan Ozer, the moderator, will relay those questions to the panel uh, after the uh, panelists give their presentations. So with that, I'd like to thank Signiant, our diamond sponsor for Streaming Media East Connect, and we have a brief video message from them now. When the director calls action. And action. When the game is on. It's or it's time to save the universe again. Media Shuttle is there. Trusted by more than 25,000 media companies, Media Shuttle delivers, making it easy and secure to send any size file anywhere fast. The journey begins with Media Shuttle portals, customized and branded for any project and designed to be so easy, your end users will love it. All while giving operations teams complete control through a simple yet powerful admin interface. Add users, set permissions, customize file delivery specs, and report on all activity. Blast off with proprietary acceleration technology. Media Shuttle moves your content anywhere in the internet connected world at hyper speeds. Along the way, your files are protected. Our commitment to enterprise grade security has made Media Shuttle a preferred tool with Hollywood studios, major sports leagues, broadcasters, and more. With Media Shuttle, your files are never handed over to Signiant. File movement is orchestrated between the end user's workstation and your storage, whether on-prem or in the cloud. Your IT team simply provisions your storage, connecting it to the Media Shuttle cloud service, and Signiant handles the rest. Get started on your Media Shuttle journey today, a journey without limits. I would also like to thank Tag Video Systems for sponsoring this session and Tag's Paul Briscoe will be one of the presenters and panelists. At streaming media events, we oscillate between very technical topics and more business and strategy and content oriented topics. And this is definitely gonna be one of the more technical sessions. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more about CMAF and Dash HLS interoperability from this all-star panel. With that, I will pass things to our moderator, Jan Ozer. Jan. Thank you, Eric. And welcome, everyone. Welcome to the panelists. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, serving multiple ABR formats with a single set of files has been the holy grail of adaptive streaming since its inception. CMAP looked like the answer when it was first announced, but as I wrote when it launched, the incompatible encryption schemes made CMAP feel like a non-starter. Instead of two separate file sets, one for HLS and one for Dash, we had two sets of files, one encrypted in CBC, the other in CTR. Since then, the picture has gotten much brighter. Not only have several new services been announced using CMAP-only content, some of which we'll hear about today, um, many other services are starting to deploy CMAF in existing services. Um, so today, you'll hear from Zachary Kava, who's media engineering architect from Disney Streaming, who will tell us how Hulu and Disney are using CMAF. Then Cyril Concolato, senior software engineer from Netflix, will discuss how Netflix is packaging their video presentations. And then Paul Briscoe, chief architect for TAG Video Systems, which provides software and services to OTT and live producers, will discuss how CMAF is being used in his company for their clients. 
Now, beyond these existing uses of CMAP behind the scenes, an industry group called the Consumer Technology Association WAVE project has been using CMAP to create a set of specifications and test suites for content, devices, and APIs all based on CMAP. Soon for the first time, encoders and packagers will be able to produce a single set of CMAP formatted files that should play on all CMAP players, eliminating most of the compatibility issues that has plagued streaming to date. This will allow streaming producers to focus on adding features and improving performance rather than fixing bugs that never should have existed in the first place. To tell us a bit about WAVE and some recent survey results from the organization, we have John Simmons, Chair, CTA WAVE Content Specification Task Force, Media Entertainment, and WC3 Evangelist, who will speak last. So let me hand it off to Zach. Take it away. Zach, you're on mute. Classic uh, online panel then. Um, Thanks, Jen. Uh, yes, I, I'm excited to be here today representing uh, Disney Streaming to kind of give you a little bit of history about what we've done with uh, CMAF uh, and the, dive a little bit deeper into the topic of Dash and HS interoperability because I think it's something that kind of gets glossed over a little uh, time to time. But let's, let's start out uh, with a tale of history, right? Uh, it's got something gold and something new, something green and something blue, right? Um, and it's my opinion that the, the Hulu and Disney Plus products are great examples of just how much CMAS, CMAF has changed the shape of our streaming industry, right? These two products launched in very, very different timeframes and through it uh, had very different experiences in getting content to users. Now, you know, we could take Hulu as a starting example, right? The service launched in 2007 and it brought the reality of current season TV to streaming, which was great. It was, uh, it was an on-demand product uh, with ad support, of course. And it started on the web, but then soon came to devices. As devices came into the picture, uh, so did the support for formats. And there were many, many devices back then. There's, still, there's many more today, but there's, there were also many, many formats. At one point, the Hulu product supported over 10 unique combinations of packaging and encryption formats. That's everything from the you know, Dash and HLS that we know today using ISO BMFF and MPEG TS. Um, but there, it's also the, all the old ones as well. So we got Smooth Streaming, HDS, RTMPE. There was even some proprietary versions of uh, encryption and DRM done because it was paramount to uh, protect that content. And this is all without multiplying uh, the number of encodes you're doing for resolution. Uh, uh, and so it was a lot uh, to distribute and it created a lot of complexity in what was going on. Um, in order to really distribute this and try and make it efficient, everything was done very dynamically. Uh, Dash, HLS, Smooth Streaming, all of these formats were generated on demand um, in order to account for both a reuse of assets across formats where possible, but also to account for things like uh, personalized user ad insertion. And that, that worked fairly well for the system. But as the product continued to grow, it, this really became the cost of agility, right? Back in 2007, 720p was a great thing to have on a service. It was kind of one of the banner features. And then 1080p came along and it was a little hard, but you could add, uh, you could add another rendition tier on top of what you had. But then things like next generation features were out of reach, right? Um, if you try to do anything around Ultra HD or for, uh, HDR, um, even something around surround sound uh, or spatial audio, they, you started talking about new codecs and uh, different ways to interact. And that's something the system simply couldn't handle because of the complexity of all these different devices and formats and players that had been implemented to, to, to deal with it. But starting in 2016, as we began working on the live TV product, we really needed to tackle this problem. And we started heavily normalizing this flow as into Dash with ISO BMFF and HLS with MPEG TS. Um, this was on its own a great win, right? All of the devices that launched with the new updated Hulu application were streaming one of these two formats. Uh, and at the time, Dash was the primary format for Hulu. Um, everything that was uh, basically not an uh, HLS required device was running uh, Dash and ISO BMFF. And these ISO BMFF were actually uh, compliantly formatted along with uh, the CMAP specification. Um, so when 
HLS adopted CMAF, uh, ended up formalizing CMAF support, we were able to consolidate all of our packaging. Uh, yes, there's still two CTR versus CBC uh, uh, encryption modes, right? Um, but that's the overall handling and packaging of the files was extremely streamlined. Um, and that, so we, that's where we are today, right? We've got a very vast catalog of content. There's no way we could do the full content re-encodes and repackagings that we were doing for the, in the old days uh, to enable new devices. Today, devices support CMAF and we're able to leverage that support uh, to get, uh, uh, to simplify our distribution and build innovations on top of that. But if we fast forward a little bit more, we get to 2019 and that's when Disney Plus launched. Right, Disney Plus brought the best of the Disney catalog uh, to streaming users for the first time. Um, and it's common now, right? Like uh, this was an on-demand offering, but it launched, it had to launch on every device. It's now table stakes for a streaming service to be on lots of devices, but it doesn't have to, it didn't have to deal with everything around formats. It was able to launch with CMF as its format. And this translated into a lot of its scale, right? This, this, uh, this product didn't launch just in the US, it launched worldwide with everything under the sun uh, available from the deep library that is Disney's. And this, the, this simplicity of a single format really let it scale and uh, capture this, which if there, there was any set of additional formats or devices that had to be supported, it really wasn't going to work. But the other thing that it did gain from this was day one, next generation media quality was available. Disney Plus didn't launch without 4K or HDR. It had it day one, and it had users experiencing the best versions of those contents for the first time in many instances. Um, and this, like, I feel that this highlights a very different picture and landscape of how streaming was done, right? A long time ago, there was a lot of complexity and customization in making streams work. Today, that has become so simplified and made easy by the CMAF specification um, that really as an organization, we believe that CMAF is the foundation of an innovative media experience. And it's with these simple and well-defined building blocks of assets, we can build rich and immersive experiences for our users that push the boundaries of their interactions with the media. Right? But it's important to note that these are just the building blocks, right? It's not the media experience itself. The media experience is something that is coming through via the manifest format, manifest and playlist formats. And that's where Dash and HLS interoperability actually becomes a very significant um, uh, topic. Um, the manifest and playlists are the things that define the media experience. And so you need to be able to represent those CMAF assets equally in both forms, uh, that in any form that you're using, really. Um, even if you're, uh, it's, it's possible to go with a single format deployment and there are a lot of uh, optimizations and uh, desire to get to a single format for the manifest as well. Um, but until we get there, being able to ensure that we have all the same media experiences across the board in both formats is a very big win. And so we have worked a long time within the Hulu product to try and define interoperability between Dash and HLS. And there's actually a group that started up under CTA Wave to help define this, right? And there's two points to uh, Dash and HLS interoperability. The first is the constraints that actually manifest formats have on the CMAF uh, uh, files themselves. The inherent nature of how Dash and HLS were specified and came about first actually further constrains the CMAF uh, structures. Not, not terribly so, but it takes away a couple of optional points. And a lot of those things were not well known, right? If you had been doing it for a long time uh, or your, your company had a history in deploying video, you understood how to how to deal with this uh, and had it kind of well tuned, but anyone coming new to the party was trying to figure it out, and we wanted to make sure that we could capture this as part of this group, uh, this CTA Wave group. And the other thing is uh, cross conversion between the two formats. When we are when you're representing a experience in one format, it should be easy to represent it in another. Uh, that way, you're able to maximize the delivery uh, of that experience across number, numerous devices to users. And so this is where the CTA 505, 5005-HLS interoperability specification came from. And it's not focused on just constraints. It's focused on powering real life use cases. So things like basic on-demand streaming and, live, and basic live streaming, right? Those seem very simple, but there's actually very fundamental constraints that you need to place on the media in order to go, in, in order to bring the content to, to bulk. But of course, that's not the only thing people do, right? We want to we achieve new things like low latency live streaming, encrypted media, 
presentations and then bringing things like presentation splicing in to have bumpers and ads. Uh, this, these are all very key and enablement cases that we wanted to ensure were captured and well-defined. And so we built a specification around this uh, in, the, in the Wave Group. And I'm, at, I'm excited to say that it was actually published uh, this morning uh, and it's available at cta.tech slash standards. Uh, it's completely free. Uh, you do have to go through a, a little store uh, um, front, but it is completely free. Um, so I, I really invite everyone to check it out and um, learn a bit more about the what you need to do to bring the same assets into both the manifest forms. Uh, but with that, I'll end my spiel and I will pass it over to uh, Cyril. Thank you, Zach. Um, so I'm going to present um, what what we do with uh, CMAF at Netflix. So I'm Cyril Concolado. I work in uh, the media systems team at Netflix, which is part of Encoding Technologies. And um, yeah, I'm also co-chair of the CMAF group at MPEG. So I, I, I want to give you my perspective on CMAF. Um, this presentation is uh, based on a tech blog that I, article that I published uh, back in February uh, called Packaging Award-Winning Shows with Award-Winning Technology. And you'll see which award-winning technology I'm talking about soon. And for the award-winning shows, you have an example here. Um, and I encourage you to go and have a look at this uh, blog post if you want more details or, or more context. Um, before explaining how we use CMAF, I just want to highlight the features of, uh, uh, of the uh, a typical uh, container format or packaging format that we want to have at Netflix. And this is uh, from, from the blog post. Um, so in, in our architecture at Netflix, and I think it's shared by many here, uh, we use an audio and video encoder that produces an elementary stream. And this elementary stream has a codec specific syntax, so it could be AVC could be AV1 for video, it could be HEAC for audio. And then the job of the packager is to produce a packaged format or a container format that is agnostic of the codec so that client devices can process the, uh, the package files uh, in, a, in a generic way, for example, for seeking or for initializing the player or for, uh, for playback in general. Um, so the, the key features we want in a packager format are synchronization. Of course, that's the obvious one. Um, and that, that's given by uh, things like timelines, timescales, timestamps, and that's, that's really the basic feature you, you would want. The, the next one is uh, the seeking aspect, right? When you have a content, you want to be able to replay, go back, go forward, uh, especially when you're in on-demand, like on, on, on Netflix. Um, then you, you, Netflix relies a lot and on, on this uh, feature of adaptive streaming. And that means that the packager's job is to create uh, so-called self-contained segments. And, and in a non-demand scenario, it has to index them, enabling um, the download to start uh, at any place, almost. And, and an important feature, if you want to have a service that starts quickly is you want to your packager format to or your packaging format to enable early uh, player initialization, whether it's for decryption and you want to signal the encryption mode and so on, or whether it's for rendering, you want to signal with whether your pipe, rendering pipeline should be initialized with SDR or HDR uh, characteristics. So to realize uh, these uh, packaging features, we rely at Netflix on two uh, key technologies. Uh, uh, one is ISO BMFF, the, so the ISO-based media file format developed by MPEG and the CANC or Common Encryption Specification. And yeah, we're really proud that this uh, ISO BMFF technology was awarded an, a Tech Emmy uh, in January for its uh, uh, service, 20 years of service. So that's, uh, that's really uh, a key uh, to Really a, a good recognition for this technology. But this technology is like 20 years old now. So it grew, it grew with a lot of tools and not all of these tools are needed. And therefore um, it's good to have a documentation of what actual tools are needed. And, and that's what we, we do with CMAF, right? We use CMAF as a set of constraints on, on, on ISO BMFF and common encryption. 
and and that's what provides us with the compatibility with Dash and HLS playback. So we we heavily rely on, on CMAF. Um, we Netflix didn't deploy CMAF from the beginning. Like we had we had different formats earlier, and and we we are migrating uh, our um, packaging to CMAF a bit like uh, Zach presented in his presentation. We started with legacy devices that had uh, formats like PIF and, and now we're moving to CMAF, but it, it doesn't happen in a day, right? So um, the way we approach the problem at Netflix is that uh, we have to take into account legacy devices. We want to maintain, we want to simplify our packaging workflow, but we want to maintain um, playback on the existing devices. So. Mm -hmm. The approach we use to deploy CMAF is to do a codec by codec deployment. Uh, and we started with um, um, the more modern codecs uh, like AV1 or XHEAC, which don't have, for which we don't have legacy devices. And then we, what we're doing is we're gradually uh, replacing the packages for old codecs, so AVC, VP9, HEVC, and so on, through typical A-B testing. So that's a, a long process. Sometimes we find issues with some devices. We need either to patch them or find an alternative. Um, but th that's, how, that's how we do it. And today we're, we are already deploying CMAP for AV1 and uh, XHEAC, and we are in the process of doing this for ABC and, and others. Um, but I want to highlight uh, how we, we did it for AV1. So um, you may not all be familiar with, uh, with AV1, uh, so I, I just want to give you a quick, quick uh, overview here. In our uh, pipeline, AV1 is uh, our encoder is producing an elementary stream, and in the context of AV1, the stream is de de decomposed into open bitstream units (OBUs). That, if you're familiar with AVC or HEVC, they have null units, so AV1 has a similar concept. And then our packager, the role here uh, is to parse this elementary stream and produce. Um, CMAF segments, but, but to do that, it first detects what's so-called temporal units. So that's the boundaries, the time boundaries between frames, and, and it determines the timing. And here I would hi highlight that AV1 is really simplified compared to other codecs in the sense that we don't have the complexities around uh, frame reordering uh, or the nasty leading pictures you can have in other codecs or and you don't need in the packaging things like edit lists, which are always very, very uh, difficult to handle in, in implementations. Similarly, there's another simplification done in, in uh, CMAF binding for AV1 around sequence header OBU, so which are equivalent, if you're familiar with AVC and HEVC, to parameters, parameter sets like VPS, PPS, and NSPS. And CMAF for AV1 recommends a way to do in-band and out-of-band uh, signaling so where for other codecs, you have to maintain two pipelines. You have your on-demand, you have your out-of-band pipeline and your in-band pipeline. Here for uh, AV1, there's just one pipeline, one simplification. Same thing for uh, encryption. Uh, AV1 uh, recommends the encryption using CVCS and uh, with a 1.9 encryption pattern. So you don't need for AV1 to maintain uh, two uh, uh, en encryption uh, pipelines, no, no dichotomy between CTR and CBC, just one. And finally, um, in our system, we, we use uh, CMAF and we use the structure, typical structural um, constraints of CMAF, but with the on-demand approach. So for example, we use segment indexing or, or sub-segment indexing. So that, that, that is really the, the first uh, format that we've deployed with, uh, with CMAF, and it was really, a, a, I would say, an easy deployment due to all these simplifications. And that's it for me. Uh, so I think next, this is Paul. Thank you, Cyril. I think you just have to turn off your screen sharing because I can't steal it away. Okay. And there we go. So good afternoon, morning or evening to everyone and greetings from beautiful, sunny Toronto, Canada. Uh, my name is Paul Briscoe. I'm Chief Architect with Tag Video Systems and happy to talk to you today uh, about CMAF. And uh, oh, I need to start my video too. And there we go. 
get everything running now. Okay, we're all lit up. But I want to talk to you about what I've entitled CMAF in the evolving world of OTT. And I'd like to tell you a little about TAG, uh, a little about why we really don't care about CMAF and why we also really care a lot. And as soon as I get focused, I can advance the slide. So, you know, talking before this call, I know we have a few people on here who remember past days and many on the call will as well remember a time when there was over the air TV and okay, maybe cable TV, maybe even you're old enough to remember Beetle Bailey. But um, it was really simple, right? I'm not even gonna read that list, but it made life so simple. And this is where I started life, where many of us started life in the analog or perhaps the standard deaf era, even the HD era. But it was all super simple and, and life was simple, but it was also quite boring. There's a reason for this, of course, and that is we evolved from a world of hardware. Hardware ran everything. There may have been software in the hardware in later days, but it was a hardware centric universe from the TV tube uh, in the camera, from the Viticon or Plumicon, all the way through the RF transmission path, back down to your CRT. So, yeah, you know, it was a very quiet world for a long time. And we evolved from black and white to color, from color to SD, we got into digital and digital became HD, became UHD. And meanwhile, this thing called the internet came along. So it really changed the game a lot. And so this is all behind us now, right? So we have so many audio formats and when you stop and think there's actually an annoying number of audio formats, especially if you include live production. Uh, we have many video standards and formats. The reason I say formats separate from standards is we have, we have standards like HD and UHD at 16 by nine, but the actual formats, um, the, the pixel resolutions can be many and varied uh, in OTT, right? This is stuff that legacy people aren't used to. We have various frame rates to deal with. Uh, delivering 24 frames per second to somebody's TV set was never a thing in the past. We use 3.2 and all these things, right? We have many transmission methods, many receiver types. I'm holding, I'm talking on one now. I have another in my hand. There's another screwed to the wall in the next room. Um, and so on and so on. And we have to be careful what we wish for because all of this complexity gives us great opportunity to do amazing things, which is of course what we're doing today. The reason for this, of course, is software. As the world moves to programmable hardware called computers and running software, it changes the game completely. Now, I gotta tell you about the TAG model and what we do. What we do is we do monitoring, probing, and multi-viewing. We build a software product and it's one product and it basically can receive just about anything you can send to it. And it will probe and monitor all the layers within the, within the stream being received or streams being received. And it can do many things. It can look at the content and look for compliance. It can look for alarm conditions as defined by the customer or alarm conditions against standard. Uh, we can produce multi-view mosaics. And the key here is that we're all software. The decision was made by the TAG founders to build an all software platform. It was gonna be all IP input and output, multi-format, multi-transport and multi-domain. Internally it's modular. So all of the different building blocks can be glued together as we require and as we go along and new formats and standards come, we can glue the necessary existing blocks with the new ones and continue to evolve. It's highly agile, it's highly adaptive and it's highly scalable. We can turn on a dime because it's software based and it opens the door to really endless opportunity of new formats, transports and new consumers, which of course is what OTT is all about. And just to make things sweeter, we have what we call a zero friction licensing model, which is a model where you can uh, run a CapEx model, an OpEx model, a mix of both, and the same license can be used for any application in the product. But I wanna give you some insight into why we don't care about CMAF. First of all, we cover all of these pieces of domain here. We do live production, we do broadcasters with playout and live production, as well as pay TV traditional, and today, of course, OTT. And here's our model, and this is where CMAF sort of gets lost in the noise. And the reason is down there where it says IP media network, and I've just, this slide really just focuses on distribution. Um, there's many things that can be coming in from this IP media network. I've just shown a couple of them here. But once we get this stuff, we do a whole bunch of stuff with it. This is where we do our, our monitoring and probing. This is where we do our audio video decoding. We build our multi-view mosaics. It's also where we do our alarm filtering, our event management, and deliver stuff to external systems to be able to take action on alarms, to be able to log alarms, to be able to manage SLAs, all that stuff that you have to do. Um, and CMAF is just one input format as far as we're concerned. So, you know, on one hand, it's just one of many, but on another hand, it is a very important thing for us going forward. Here's our moving target challenge at TAG. You guys with your end-to-end -end systems, you're so lucky. 
you evolve from one or two formats to another and that is so easy and so simple and i don't mean to trivialize it of course it's a painful journey we walk it with all of our customers for us, however, we have to receive and handle everything, right? So we have video formats, we, we have the associated metadata, we have audio formats, we have today immersive audio, we have volumetric audio. Video, we're gonna have volumetric camera before very long. All of these have metadata. We have the transport formats, which includes HLS, includes, of course, uh, well, includes CMAF, includes everything. We have the codecs involved, which today are one thing and tomorrow will be something yet again. And then we have DRM, and not just one DRM, but several DRMs, right? And we have to go and probe all this stuff, look at it parametrically, look at the metadata associated with it. And in the case of video and audio, we have to visualize and listen. And that's why to us, CMAF, CMAF is one of many things. But we can't let go. These features are cumulative so far anyway. And as we continue to try and converge, we discover that the world will continue to expand in front of us. However, the convergence that CMAF brings to the table is a really important thing for us. And CMAF is a, a very good juncture uh, we see in the Dash and HLS uh, evolution. Uh, we have an interesting little approach to decryption I just wanted to share with you because we try and avoid complexity and heaven knows there's tons of complexity in both encryption and the DRM backend. Uh, so we do this by avoiding the DRM part of the system. Uh, this is kind of tricky and it works really, really well. And the reason we have to do this is because we can monitor hundreds of channels in a single instance of tag and doing a full DRM client transaction as well as the DRM on hundreds of channels is a heck of an overhead. And so it seems to be, turns out it's a lot simpler to simply do what we're doing here. Um, whoop, don't do that. So we, we install within the secure zone of the customer premise. So we are now within a place where keys can flow and where it's safe and secure. And rather than integrating with DRM, we simply talk to the key management platform. So what we do is we go and we authenticate to the key management system and we simply deliver a stream of keys and we decrypt directly. So it makes it super simple. And this allows us then to decrypt and deal with a very large number of AVR streams. And we don't need set top box. We don't need to integrate with the DRM backend or client side. It's all very smooth and it's all very, very effective. And in software, the burden is much lower than if we were handling the DRM, which of course just leads us to more and more channels per unit of compute power. This is particularly important when you're running in the cloud, and it's equally important when you run it on the ground, because at the end of the day, you run out of compute power in one instance of compute, and you have to look beyond it. So the more we can cram into an instance of compute, even as that continues to grow, is a good thing. So at TAG, CMAF has been a very important thing. It's a super robust method for OTT. The convergence uh, that we see CMAF bringing is enabling customers to move to CMAF uh, with great success. Now, for us, we have Dash customers, we have HLS customers, and many of these customers, and I won't say any names of who's in, on the call and not on the call here, but um, have evolved or are evolving into CMAF. Many, of course, are retaining their existing Dash and HLS presences while adding CMAF. Um, many are using uh, CMAF as they evolve into, for example, HDR or UHD. And for us, it's a matter of simply supporting a different input format and not to trivialize what, what CMAF is because CMAF is super important, but for us, it's basically an input format selection. Uh, so if you're, if you're HLS, you say, okay, I want to receive HLF and HLS. And if you're CMAF, you say, I want to receive CMAF. So for us, that part's easy. And for us, it enables us to provide monitoring, probing and multi-viewing then to customers as they evolve into multi-format and hopefully maybe someday single format methods. The distributing advantage is huge, right? The, the advantage at the edge in particular and the advantage for converged manifests and metadata is really, really important. And for us, it just fits our model. It's, it's just software. And if it's software, we can deal with it. We are seeing a huge uptake in usage. We implemented this in 2019. Uh, we've had a couple of deployments, a very large deployment in early 2020 with great success. Um, and we see a little less, however, in replacement. We see uptake in added usage but we don't see a lot of HLS and Dash being torn down quite yet, which is fine for us. Again, it's just a matter of selecting the input format. I guess the big question is CMAF, is, is 42, is it the answer to everything? Well, uh, it's not our world today, but CMAF is not gonna go away anytime soon. We no longer have major things that replace something completely, but evolution now has less and less overlap, but I see CMAF as something that will have long legs and uh, and, It'll, it'll live for quite some time. And so far it's been very, very successful. I was thrilled to hear that 5005 published just this morning 
and all of these advancements uh, bring CMAF uh, one step closer to perhaps dominating uh, fairly completely in the OTT world. So the future is bright, but it's also made of software, and this makes me the happiest. We have more audio formats. Okay, we'll deal with them. Video standards and formats. Okay, frame rates. Sure, transmission methods. Yeah, receiver types. All this stuff. It's software, 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 and it just means more fun for people to implement because we like implementing, but it means more opportunity for content vendors to get their content into people's hands to deliver that quality of content that people long for. Do you remember the term broadcast quality? We may talk about it again someday. So that's what it's all about, delivering quality of experience to your customer. And with that, I thank you for your time. And I'd like to turn it over now to John Simmons, and he is going to carry on for us. Hi, uh, this is John Simmons. Um, I was at Microsoft for 16 years and I led the uh, effort between Microsoft and Apple to create the CMAF specification. Uh, what I want to do is to give you sort of a, a big picture of what's happening uh, with CMAF and its relationship to all the other industry standards. And in particular about what happened over the last 10 years because uh, revolutions tend to, in the tech industry, tend to happen uh, over, over a long period of time. And uh, Paul was talking about how CMAF hasn't quite completely taken over the world. But if you, if you look at the transition over the last 10 years, I think uh, it'll become apparent how significant that's become. I want to talk a little bit about the WAVE project um, and the CMAF industry forum, um, both of which uh, were created to promote the adoption of CMAF. A CMAF Industry Forum specifically about CMAF, a CTA wave, which runs the CMAF Industry Forum, was created to promote interoperability between uh, HTML5 and CMAF. Um, and we'll talk about that and where that's been going. And then I want to talk a bit about the importance of uh, global web media interoperability um, and uh, what uh, wave is uh, planning on doing to promote that. And I think this is actually, to me, since uh, I, what I make my living working for companies on standards efforts, um, uh, and uh, to me, this is the most interesting thing that's happening because it's what will influence what 2030 looks like. And I think that's where uh, a major inflection is going to happen for the broadcast industry um, in terms of web delivered video. And then finally, uh, uh, you know. Zach was talking about how we just published the Dash HLS interop spec, and CTA Wave did uh, this morning. Uh, that was uh, kind of a coincidence, actually. It was being worked on, finally approved by the steering committee uh, just recently. Uh, it just happened to pop out today. So I encourage you to take a look at it. It's the first draft, and we'd love to get your feedback on it. But I want to uh, also share with you some of the uh, results of the CMAF adoption survey that we just recently did. So putting things in context, uh, there are, um, and if you've ever heard me talk about this before, this is a slide that I've used many times showing the relationship between common encryption, CMAF, both Dash and HLS, which are not replaced by CMAF, but use CMAF as a common encoding format. And we'll talk about that a bit more in a second. The various media extensions that were created by W3C and, uh, and progressive web apps, although that may be replaced by mini apps in the future, we'll see what happens. And these are all, all these specs are publicly available today. You can take a look at those. Let's talk about a bit about what CMAF, came, where it came from. Uh, in uh, 2015, Microsoft and, uh, and uh, Apple um, shared our ideas about a common media format between HLS and Dash and also to uh, extend common encryption to support what they used, which is CBCS encryption mode, which we did. We added that to common encryption. And then in 2016, uh, we got together with a group of companies that we had shared our ideas with, who are listed here, uh, and we submitted requirements for and a draft specification for CMAF. Uh, CMAF eventually became a standard in 2018, supporting low latency and adaptive streaming. But uh, CMAF was created for Dash HLS Interop. I think it's important to know that, but it's not the whole story. Um, so everyone knows that, as I just said, 
you know, we started our collaboration in 2014. We shared it in 2015. Uh, we submitted to uh, MPEG and then published in 2018. But this all began in 2009 and 2010 when uh, Microsoft proposed the common encryption standard. There wasn't a standard yet. Uh, and at MPEG, there was a call for proposal for what became DASH. And DASH and common encryption were then published in 2012, which led to uh, another activity that happened right before that, excuse me, it didn't lead to it. It was also uh, a very important meeting that took place in Berlin at Fraunhofer Focus, where it was proposed by media companies that there should be changes to HTML5 to support a commercial media streaming, which led to the EME MSE specs uh, and, um, and uh, which basically worked with common encryption and worked with Dash. But still we had this issue about common uh, interoperability between CMAF and HTML5 at the meeting where we proposed uh, creating these standards, uh, we also, I had a breakfast meeting with CTA where it was proposed that we create the WAVE project to promote that interoperability. This led to the publication of three, specific, uh, three specifications, one of which we'll talk about a bit more, which is the CMAF media profiles. And it also led to the creation of the CMAF industry forum. So, um, uh, WAVE basically was created to uh, promote the adoption of CMAF, but then it created the CMAF Industry Forum, which is strictly about uh, promoting CMAF as the encoding format worldwide for adaptive delivery. And so let's talk about what that means. So WAVE started publishing um, media profiles, not all the profiles that CMAF has defined, but all the profiles that were had a adequate market uh, penetration for the codex. So we had a process we developed to approve media profiles, uh, which we still are doing every year. We publish a new list of media profiles, which are very targeted content options, targeting different codecs for those uh, for CMAF. And then we publish that specification uh, uh, on an annual basis. Now, the CMAF interop though, for it to be interoperable across the globe, you notice that Dash Industry Forum and DVB and 3GPP, everyone is, and, and the IPTV Forum, all of these organizations are now moving to CMAF as the standard for what they're encoding for, for content. So CTA WAVE is, in, is discussing how we will collaborate with those different organizations to define common media profiles across the industry and because we're already in the process of creating test repositories for CMAF, then we'll share those repositories with those other organizations, some of which I've listed here, so that they can use test interoperability based on a common set of profiles for global media distribution. Because let's explain this, this is what where the broadcast industry is going. It's going to the web and it's gonna to go to the web and it's gonna be a kind of a tipping point in 2030, 2035. At the same time, WAVE has been creating automated tests for devices to test their ability to perform correctly playing back CMAP media content. So it's our goal to create the test infrastructure, open source, make it available across the industry for testing compliance with CMAP. So we did send out a CMAP industry forum a survey. Uh, it's not published yet, but I got permission to share some of it. This is where the respondents came from. Uh, to the survey. And uh, so here's a couple of examples of things that were said. Uh, here's some CMAF usage plans and transport use of CMAF today. Um, you can see that uh, uh, there's a significant number of people said they don't, but they are, uh, but there's an even more, even more people were saying, uh, or nearly as many were saying they're using CMAF today. And, uh, and then you could see that they're using it um, uh, using uh, CMAP with both uh, DASH and HLS, that's a third of the people today. But if you look at where they're going in the future, you can see that this is uh, gonna change significantly. Um, uh, there's plans for these people to use, but for both DASH and the people who are not yet using it are moving to using DASH with HLS and, uh, excuse me, CMAP with HLS and DASH in significant numbers. So I think, it's the important thing to take away from this is, is that practically everyone 
is moving, who's doing HLS is moving to CMAP and the Dash industry is moving to CMAP. And that's the important thing to take away. On the encryption mode question, we asked people, which encryption mode are you using? And uh, to Jan's comment earlier about common encryption, it, it was actually very interesting that 34% said they're using both CBCS and CENC, but there are quite a few who are also using CBC, CBC1, which is just pure CBC uh, without the skip mode. And, uh, and uh, we think that the reason for this is legacy devices. There are many legacy devices, although PlayReady today does support CBCS mode. And so all new PlayReady devices and new PlayReady applications uh, support CBCS mode. Legacy devices, many of them in hardware, only support counter mode or CENC. So that's one of the reasons why we're seeing in this survey um, quite a, still a, a wide variety of different encryption modes being supported. Um, I really encourage you to uh, go to the CMAP Industry Forum website uh, and uh, we'll be uh, posting there, I'm not sure of the date, but we'll be posting there a, the complete report, which was much more extensive than the few slides that I've shared here, showing exactly what, uh, what we've seen uh, is the adoption rate of CMAP, as well as uh, responses on the use of HTML5. So uh, that's my presentation. I'll hand it back to Jan. Okay, thank you. Um, and all the panelists should... Okay, perfect. Let me um, start off the Q&A by saying that if you have any questions, uh, please enter them in the Q&A box. Um, all the panelists will be supplying PDF versions of their presentation to Steve, who will then get them emailed out to all the people who attended this uh, session. So you don't have to worry about getting the handouts. And looking at the questions, um, the first one goes to Zach. Um, what kind of discussion was there surrounding devices not to support when you launched Disney? Because obviously that was part of your decision to go CMAP only. Uh, the, you know, the thing I would say is that the, the greater focus was on getting a ubiquitous format, right? Because that was, there's going to be so much need, uh, to leverage that in order to gain the overall scale and deployment of the, the system. Right. And so it was less of a question around what devices to cut and more around, um, was there any gains that we would get out of supporting those devices? Uh, and at the, at the point in time, uh, it, the, there really isn't, right? The majority of devices that we need to launch to had CBCS support and that's that's going back pretty far. You're going down to 2017 and in some cases, 2016. Um, of course, there's a gradient of support for CTR versus CBC. Uh, but as of today, there's really not a device that you're not gonna be able to run CBC and it depend, and depending on really how deep the catalog you wanna go, uh, you, a practicality of supporting CTR is really just a uh, what 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 enables a, a back compatibility until those devices phase out? Why why was that decision different than what you what you're doing with Hulu? If you're not losing device support, I mean, because there you had. <laughs> it's it's much easier to uh, uh, establish a product on uh, new on devices rather than remove a product from devices, right? If after somebody has become uh, used to using a, a, a the application on a device, it becomes a much harder decision to remove it. Um, something I think uh, Cyril would, would be very much aware of as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, the uh, next question goes to Cyril. Um, you talked a couple of times about, uh, about uh, the Q&A associated with launching CMAF using different codecs. Could you go into that a little bit more? I mean, if, if, I'm, gonna, if I'm gonna convert to CMAF for H.264, how much work am I gonna have to do to, to ensure compatibility? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess there are two aspects to it, right? There's the encoding of the video itself. Um, CMAF has recommendations on how you should encode your video, what the video should contain, for example, things like a VUI, uh, a message. Um, and, and then, so that might need, you might need to make sure that the devices you're sending, your, the stream encoding according to, v, to CMAF you need to make sure that they will support it. And then there's the packaging side of it. So uh, at Netflix, we're quite lucky because we had already for ABC, for example, we had 
an encoding that was already uh, compliant to CMAF or, or very close to being compliant to CMAF. So we didn't have to change much. The, the difference was in, in, these are very, very technical and very subtle details in the packaging, like, you know, stupid things like order of boxes, you know, some devices would support order A, B, and some others would support B, A, and CMAF would recommend to do B, A. So if you had, if you wanted to deploy CMAF to those devices, you'd have to either modify the, on the fly, the content when you receive it, or you had to do tricks, right? Um, but I, I'd say this is very, very minor. For deploying, deploying ABC and CMAF was very, uh, it's just a matter of testing, making sure that all your pool of devices supported, but we didn't leave many, many devices behind for that. Okay. Um, this one going out to Paul, of, of the clients of yours that are converting over to CMAF, how many of them are able to stop producing separate file stores for HLS and Dash? And you know, when will that, when will that happen if they're not able to do it right away? Yeah, I mean that that speaks to the device problem, of course, and it was it was kind of fun, to, you know, to hear Zach speak about you know a four year old device as being something you consider dropping because of course things are so so ephemeral today. Um, it varies. Uh, we're we, of course we don't have huge commercial view on what people do with our licenses. So when somebody with an HLS uh, infrastructure comes along and says, "Oh, I'm going to start up fire up some CMAF, give me some more licenses," and we do. We don't have the visibility on when they dial down their HLSs or, or dashes or whatever, um, but we feel that this is going to be uh, an ongoing trend. I, I don't know that any time in the foreseeable future we're going to see dash or HLS go dark, um, but as John showed uh, with his uh, pie charts there, I mean things are moving definitely uh, in a direction here. An interesting, you know, an interesting thing if you think back, well those of us on here most remember, you know, 25 years ago, there was a big talk about convergence. There's going to be a big convergence of things and nobody really knew what it was. And I mean, the convergence we care about is the convergence of content with consumer and the in between for the past 25 years has been a mix of all sorts of stuff from cable to satellite to, you know, various flavors of OTT and early streaming and, and, you know, various degrees of success. And actually today we finally have the opportunity for convergence in the middle. And that's the connection between the content and the consumer. And, and CMAF represents one of these super important convergence points. And that's why, you know, on one hand, I, I laugh and I say it's just an input format to tag. But on the other hand, it's a rapidly evolving and rapidly deploying one. So um, I don't know how long it'll be till the old ones get dialed down. But at the rate CMAF is being uh, adopted, I think we're going to see a fairly rapid transition in that regard. Ken, could I add to that uh, just a little bit? Uh, I just want to make sure that people understand. Uh, in the audience understand that uh, that when Apple and Microsoft got together to create the CMAF spec, they didn't create it to replace Dash or HLS. They, re they it's it, it's it was created to enable interoperability between Dash and HLS. So look, sometimes people conflate HLS with HLS with MPEG2 transport stream, which was what was used prior. But now all Apple devices that use HLS support CMAF. It's just the encoding of the content underneath the manifest, which, and so Dash and HLS should be, as, as Zach was describing, you should be able to produce a Dash or an HLS manifest. The content underneath is CMAF and it should be identical and not have to be replaced. But, but the, older, the older Dash implementations uh, were fragmented MP4 as well. In fact, what uh, Cyril was talking about, about PIF, PIF was the spec that we that I mentioned in 2009. We brought to to IBC. Um, PIF is really just a, a primitive grandfather of CMAF, um, and CMAF is just the codification and and of the of the best practices for fragmented MP4 construction for for both Dash and HLS. Okay, thanks, John. If I got it, and uh, in, interesting. So, so when you when you actually remove encryption from the equation, because um, within like advertising support or buffers or things like that, right? These are actually pieces. These are assets that are not part of the main content that are um, packaged, encoded, you know, or encoded and packaged and sent out. And those assets are actually fully CMAF and they're fully interoperable. And we just we were able to describe them to every device, right? Those are actually single 
it's a, it's the it's the ubiquitous wor- or the utopia world that we want to be in, a single uh, pool of content going to all these devices, um, and it's really it, as the as the encryption moves more and more to just CBCS, we'll have that in the content space as well. Okay, um, this one's for John. When do we expect to see profiles in encoders that essentially output to the to the CTA wave CMAF spec? Is that a, is that going to be a thing? Yeah, so so that's that's a that's a really good question. So the the the, C, the CTA wave uh, media profile spec um, is published every year, and it actually does correspond to. It's not actually specifying the media profiles; it's reference. It's a catalog of them. So some of them are published by Etsy. So Dolby's CMAF uh, implementation for their audio codecs are all published in Etsy. DTSs are published in Etsy. Uh, then, of course, there are the new codecs that have been published uh, in other uh, locations. Like, for example, there is a uh, a BBC uh, CMAF profile. It hasn't been published yet. We know it'll be published. When it's published, we'll discuss it in WAVE, and probably it will be approved to be incorporated. Um, the as, as Cyril mentioned, the Alliance for Open Media has made a AB1 CMAF profile. We haven't published uh, that yet, it's it's uh, it it could happen, but it hasn't been. But it's but the goal is to publish these profiles. Now that's what we were doing last year. What we're talking about doing now is something we should have thought about doing before. It just didn't occur to us, which is to collaborate with DVB, uh, which is pretty much all the broadcasting in in Europe, and 3GPP, which is all of the mobile phone streaming globally. Uh, to collaborate on these media profiles for OTT delivery based on CMAF because they're all moving to CMAF, but there's no there's no conversation going on between these organizations to say, here's the specific content profiles, here's the codec, it's CMAF, but then you need to talk about the specific content profiles within that codec, produce the content that can be used for interoperability testing, and then uh, Wave is producing tests that actually automate the process of testing the device's playback of that profile. And, and that process is underway this year. Uh, I expect, uh, personally, it's just me speaking as, as a, a person who participates in the discussion, I expect this year for us to see collaboration between all those organizations on uh, defining CMAF media profiles. Uh, and the last thing I'd say about this is that if you go and if you go to Europe and talk to the broadcasters there about what their plans are, uh, if you look at what DVB-I is about, which is about incorporating hybrid uh, video delivery, where some channels might be Dash uh, with whatever media profile of whatever CMAF profile, it'll be CMAF. Some channels might be that. Some channels would be broadcast, and people with DVB-I won't be able to tell which channels are OTT and which channels are not. That's the direction the broadcast industry is moving in in Europe. That's the direction they're pointed, I should say, and um, and that is all going to be CMAF and a common media profile between devices. So I expect that to 2022 to be uh, sort of a, a key year for that seeing that happen. Okay, thank you, John. Probably our last question. This is from a basketball fan in the Pacific Northwest. Um, isn't removing manifests and supporting their features directly on the CMF level the best way to finally unify HLS and Dash? Um, Cyril and Zach, why don't you guys take stabs at this one? Cyril, go, go ahead. That's a that's an interesting question. Uh, I know the basketball fan has a uh, weird mm-hmm. ideas. Um, I m- my initial reaction is that at least if I look at the architecture of the Netflix delivery system, the paths we have to produce manifest and and get the manifest to the device is not the same as the path that is used to send the content to the the client. Um, The CDN we have handles the content, but the CDN does not handle the manifest. The manifest is refreshed more, much more often than, than the content is. Mixing both uh, I mean, having a format, a single format for both. I'm not sure there's an, I, I can see some benefits, but it would be a major change. And I don't see that happening soon. Zach, 30 seconds or less. 
Sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say that it could be an ultimate goal, right? One of the things that both of these formats have that kind of hinder the overall um, forward looking stance of more immersive and advanced media presentations is that they have legacy support of things like HLS was started as a very simple format to describe things. And they're starting to evolve, right? We get HLS interstitials to bring actual ad support in, in a first class citizen form. But then Dash has the other side of it, right? It's the kitchen sink. It's, it does every, every type of media description that you want to do. Um, but CMF has actually provided a very structured and well-defined way to, to, to package media in ad, ad, additive form. And I think that you could potentially describe it in a more succinct and more uh, leverage the understanding of what CMAP is to better address it. Um, but that would, like as Cyril was saying, it would be a very drastic change. And it's something that we might get to over time, but I don't know if we have the understanding of that true shape just yet. Okay, listen, I appreciate everybody sharing um, their knowledge, their uh, company details and, and uh, other interesting factoids about CMAP over the last hour and our time's up and Thank you all for attending and, you know, look for the emails with all the content from the various speakers. Yeah, thank you Thanks. so much. Once we get uh, copies of everyone's slides, preferably in PDF format, we will uh, have someone here send them out. It won't be Steve personally, but they'll get sent out to all the people who are here. Great presentations, great discussion about a very important topic that wraps things up for this week at Streaming Media East Connect. We'll be back on Monday morning. Thanks again to our diamond sponsor, Signet, for helping make all this possible. Have a great weekend. When the director calls action. And action. When the game is on. It's good. Or it's time to save the universe again. Media Shuttle is there. Trusted by more than 25,000 media companies, Media Shuttle delivers, making it easy and secure to send any size file anywhere fast. The journey begins with Media Shuttle portals, customized and branded for any project and designed to be so easy, your end users will love it. All while giving operations teams complete control through a simple yet powerful admin interface. Add users, set permissions, customize file delivery specs, and report on all activity. Blast off with proprietary acceleration technology. Media Shuttle moves your content anywhere in the internet connected world at hyper speeds. Along the way, your files are protected. Our commitment to enterprise grade security has made Media Shuttle a preferred tool with Hollywood studios, major sports leagues, broadcasters, and more. With Media Shuttle, your files are never handed over to Signet. File movement is orchestrated between the end user's workstation and your storage, whether on-prem or in the cloud. Your IT team simply provisions your storage, connecting it to the Media Shuttle cloud service, and Signet handles the rest. Get started on your Media Shuttle journey today, a journey without limits.